a Singular Discoveries podcast. I'm walking along a country trail. It's a dirt path about 10 feet wide that cuts through thick woodland. There are tall trees on each side forming a canopy overhead. The path is dead straight. That's because this was previously a railway line. The line closed more than 50 years ago and it's been reclaimed by nature. I'm heading to an isolated and abandoned railway station way out in the woods. It's called Lint's Green Station and it's the scene of one of Britain's most mysterious unsolved murders. From Singular Discoveries, this is The Lintz Green Murder. Part 1. A Lonely Place to Die. The last train arrived at Lintz Green Station at 10.42pm, 10, 10 minutes later than scheduled. Lintz Green was a quiet rural station, midway between Newcastle-upon-Tyne and Consett, on the now-defunct Consett branch of the North Eastern Railway in the north of England. Formerly a colliery line, it carried passengers, coal and iron from the industrial villages of County Durham through the picturesque Derwent Valley to the bustling River Tyne. It was Saturday, October 7th, 1911, and the train was a little busier than usual with a handful of residents from the sparsely populated surrounds returning from a day in Newcastle, shopping, drinking, and watching Newcastle United play in the Football League. Waiting on the westbound down platform to meet them in his uniform and cap was the Lintz Green stationmaster, George Wilson. Within a few minutes, Wilson would be dead. 59-year-old Wilson was a widower who lived with his daughter in the stationmaster's house, which stood alone behind the booking office on the eastbound up platform. The station was surrounded by woodland, and the only other houses within shouting distance were a handful of plate layers cottages past the down platform. By day, Lintz Green Station was a charming English countryside location, but by night it was an isolated and lonely place. Wilson met the last train and collected the passengers' tickets with the station's booking clerk, Fred White, and its porter, Thomas Routledge. Then Routledge boarded the train to go home. Wilson and White watched the train depart in a roll of steam and iron. Then they closed up the waiting room and put out the lights on the empty platform, plunging it into gloom. Carrying their illuminated oil lamps, they walked up the stairs onto the stone bridge that arched over the railway tracks, and crossed to the opposite platform, where they went into the booking office. Wilson laid his tickets on the bench, reminded White to close the platform gate and said goodnight. Then Wilson left the office and walked with his lamp through the garden gate toward his house. It would be about a quarter to eleven o'clock. This is the account of Bertha Wilson, George Wilson's daughter. I heard a slight noise. I was in bed at the time, and I thought it was the furniture creaking, but it might have been someone who was outside. There was a candle burning on the stairhead window for father to see when he came in. I heard such a scuffling outside and I thought, oh dear, what a noise he is making. Then I heard a shot. I went to the stairhead window and shouted, are you hurt? What's the matter? He said, yes, yes. I said, I'm coming. And I ran downstairs as fast as ever I could. I shouted at the door, is there anybody there? But no one answered. Then I again shouted, Dad, are you there? I think he said something, but I dared not go any further, and I screamed. Fred White, the booking clerk, was closing the gate on the platform when he heard the gunshot and then the scream. His friend, a miner named Charles Swinburne, who had been on the train from Newcastle, was waiting to walk home with him. The two men hurried to the scene. Bertha opened the door. I said, oh, Fred, there is something happened to father. See what it is. White looked behind a tree where he saw the station master, lying on the garden path. He hurried Bertha back into the house. He shouted, oh, come away in. Oh, it was awful. Next to arrive on the scene were three more miners, Samuel Elliot, Robert Wales and Thomas Middleton, 
who had just got off the train. They were around 200 yards from the station when they heard the gunshot. There's something the matter at the station, said Elliot. The three men stopped and listened, then heard Bertha's scream and ran to the station master's house. As the three miners approached through the darkness, they saw Fred White and Bertha Wilson cowering in terror. Elliot quickly assured them they had come to help. White directed the miners behind the tree, where they found George Wilson prostrate and bleeding from a wound in his left breast. His lamp was still in his hand. Beside him was a small cloth covered in sand, its purpose unknown. The miners picked Wilson up, carried him into the house and laid him on the couch. Middleton was an ambulance man at his colliery, and he attempted to give first aid, but it seemed clear that Wilson was beyond help. Middleton loosened Wilson's collar and moistened his lips with brandy. They said to him, Mr. Wilson, speak, speak, say who did it. But the station master could only make a gurgling sound before his eyes rolled back and he died. It was just before 11 p.m. Lintz Green Station housed the Lintzford Post Office and was connected to the telephone exchange. Calls were made to a doctor and to the police. Dr. Wynne Boland arrived at 11.57 p.m. and found Wilson, quote, beyond human aid. The doctor confirmed that Wilson had been shot through the heart, left lung and aorta. He had been shot at close range and his vest, braces and shirt were singed. The bullet had passed right through his body and exited his back. Sand was found on his clothing. Superintendent Joseph Dryden and Inspector Albert Gargate from Consett Police Station arrived shortly afterward with several other officers. Several questions immediately presented themselves. Where was the murder weapon? What was the motive? What was the significance of the piece of cloth and the sand? And who, on this pitch-black night in this out-of-the-way place, was the murderer? Wilson had fought with his attacker, the police determined, and the motive was surely robbery. But there was no indication of who the attacker might be. Samuel Elliott described hearing a rustling in the bushes after the gunshot, but did not see anyone. The secluded station and the stationmaster's house were surrounded by woods, and it seemed that the murderer had slipped away undetected. As the Newcastle Chronicle later reported, not a soul but the dead man saw the assailant. George Wilson was born in Castleside in County Durham in 1852. This is Paul Brown, author of The Lintz Green Murder. We know that he began his career on the railways as a signalman before becoming a station master. He was transferred to Lintz Green in December 1903. He was a widower. His wife Annie had died in 1910, which was the year before the murder. And he lived with his unmarried daughter, who said she kept house for him. So this was Bertha, and she was 26 when her father was murdered. The newspaper reporters who descended on Lintz Green after the murder wanted to know everything about him, but there wasn't much to find out. Wilson was described as being of a very quiet disposition and a total abstainer. He was closely involved with the local Methodist church, but he was best known for the care he took of the station, and particularly its beautiful floral displays that had won him several prizes from the railway company. He was also a man of routine. Wilson was known to collect the station's cash takings at around 9pm every evening and lock it away in his house. He kept to his routine on the night he was killed, and the cash was safely secured. All he had on him when he died was a small sum of his own money, plus some coins from the waiting room vending machines. This money wasn't taken, but the motive was still supposed to be robbery. One of the first newspapers to cover the case was the Northern Daily Mail. The attack was seemingly the work of someone with a knowledge of the station, the station master and his methods from day to day. It seems to be tolerably clear that the assailant had designs upon the station's takings. Equally probable is that the person who did the deed had resolved to shoot Mr. Wilson first and then snatch the takings. He accomplished the first part of the plot but was thwarted in the second. Wilson was buried near his wife at Burnupfield, just over a mile from Lintz Green on October 10th, 1911, three days after his murder. Reports said his funeral was attended by a large concourse of mourners and sympathisers, including several other station masters and railway officials, who paid tribute to his worth. 
Those gathered to remember him must have been deeply unsettled by the knowledge that George Wilson's murderer remained at large. Part two, a flawed investigation. Police officers searched the garden of the station master's house by the light of their oil lamps and then the rising sun. A bullet, quite flattened, was found near to the doorstep. It had passed through Wilson's body, struck the wall of the house and ricocheted onto the ground. It was identified as having been fired from a revolver of large caliber. Prior to the First World War, Revolvers were not common in Britain, although they could be purchased with a license from certain gunsmiths. The 1903 Pistols Act required purchasers to obtain a license from a police station and prohibited the sale of handguns to anyone who was drunken or insane. Footprints between the doorstep of the house and tree where Wilson's body was found indicated there had been a struggle. A small cloth found next to Wilson was described as a piece of linen or cotton thought to be from a pillowcase, with a knot tied in the middle and strings at each end. Police determined that the attacker had attempted to use it as a gag, although it might also have been used as a face mask to hide the attacker's identity. Sand was found on the small cloth and on Wilson's clothing. The sand had perhaps been thrown in Wilson's face to disorientate or temporarily blind him. By the morning, the search had expanded beyond the house and garden and into the woodland but it was a passerby rather than a police officer who found the next clue. A young man found a black revolver cartridge near the footpath that the three miners, Samuel Elliott, Robert Middleton and Robert Wales, were walking along when they heard the gunshot and where Elliott had heard a rustling in the bushes. Police began to hunt for the gun, which they speculated had been thrown into the nearby River Derwent. Later that morning, a message was issued to all police stations in County Durham. Mr. Wilson, station master at Lintz Green, was murdered last night at 11 o'clock. The motive was undoubtedly robbery as a cloth gag to be placed over the mouth was found close to where the body was lying. He was shot through the heart. Two tickets were taken out for Lintz Green from Elsick Station. The party are expected to have come from Newcastle District. Two men were arrested later that day, presumed to be the two men who had bought the tickets from Elsick, a suburb to the west of Newcastle, but they were quickly cleared and released. County Durham Police made another arrest, but that individual was also released. By the following day, the police appeared to have exhausted their slender leads. Neither the murderer nor the murder weapon, nor any satisfactory explanation for the crime had been found. The inquest into the death of George Wilson opened on October 9th, two days after the murder, at the Lintz Green Station waiting rooms. Coroner John Graham, chairing the inquest, gave a speech sympathising with the local community, saying that it must have been a terrible shock to learn of such a tragedy. According to newspaper reports, he acknowledged that many of those present at the inquiry would have known Wilson very well. I have known him ever since he came to Lintz Green Station, and particularly I have noticed how fond he was of his garden, at least of flowers and ornamenting his station. Evidence of Wilson's identity was given by his uncle, Thomas Shotton, a retired railway inspector. Coroner Graham asked Shotton how Wilson's daughter Bertha was coping. Shotton said, She is keeping up very well and is better than she was yesterday. Graham replied, Will you tell her, and I'm only anticipating what the jury might say, that we all deeply grieve for her and sympathise from our hearts with her in the terrible loss she has sustained? Tell her that we shall do our best to investigate the matter, and we hope that the criminal or criminals who are responsible for this dreadful outrage will be brought to justice. Fred White, the booking clerk, was questioned as the last witness to see Wilson alive. He described how he had locked up the office and was about to go home with the minor Charles Swinburne when he heard the gunshot. According to White, because he felt rather timid, he gave Swinburne his oil lamp and Swinburne led the way. Directed by Bertha, Swinburne shone the lamp over the garden path, and they saw Wilson lying on his right side, his clothes covered in blood. The station porter, Thomas Routledge, said Wilson was in his usual spirits when he last saw him on the platform before boarding the last train to go home. After questioning Routledge, Coroner Graham decided to give the police ample time to complete their inquiries, and he adjourned the inquest for a month until November 8th. 
Meanwhile, newspapers were reporting an epidemic of crime because there had been three murder cases in the region within a week. There was a shocking triple murder at Biker in Newcastle, in which Maggie Ingram and her two young daughters were killed during an apparent burglary. Maggie's husband, Alexander, was later convicted of the murders and committed suicide in prison. And in the Northumberland village of Sheepwash, a young miner named Alfred Etheridge killed his girlfriend, Catherine Baker, with a shotgun, then turned the gun on himself. Sad as these cases are, the murder at Lintz Green will occupy the largest share of public attention. With men of this class at large, life is not safe. He ranks as a criminal of the worst stamp, and there will be no easy feeling until he is tracked and brought to justice. Then on October 11th there was a breakthrough. Police arrested a young man in Newcastle on suspicion of being involved with the Lintz Green murder. The man was described as having a knowledge of the workings of the railway station and could not account for his whereabouts on the night of the murder. His name was Samuel Atkinson. Lintz Green Station opened in 1867. Initially it was to serve the local collieries and the industrial villages. There were three collieries within a mile of the station and there was a paper mill as well. One of the newspapers reporting the murder said Lintz Green is the prettiest station on the branch. This was largely due to George Wilson's prize winning floral arrangements which sprouted from plant pots along the length of the platforms and hung from the eaves of the station buildings. The station master's house was the only dwelling on the north side of the railway line. It was a compact three-storey brick building with two large chimneys. The small garden was as well tended as the station and that was ringed by a wooden fence. On the south side of the station there were five cottages which housed railway workers, plate layers, and there were woods on either side of the track. The whole thing was surrounded by the scenic countryside of the Derwent Valley carved by the River Derwent, which flows from its source in Northumberland for 35 miles into the River Tyne. Newspapers described the station as isolated and remote and said its rural location, surrounded by woodland and very few houses, made it difficult to trace the murderer. The assailant had ample opportunity for making good his escape without detection. The place was in darkness and this fact was further to the advantage of the assailant. As the location for a murder, Lintz Green was as unlikely as it was perfect. Part 3. An Unlikely Suspect On the evening of Wednesday, October 11th, 1911, Inspector Albert Gargate of Durham Police went to a house in Kirk Street in Biker, described in the press as one of the lower class parts of Newcastle. Gargate asked to speak to a man named Samuel Atkinson, but the person who answered the door, thought to be Atkinson's mother, said he was not in. They wanted to get the police away, recalled Gargate, who refused to be deterred. He gained access to the property and found his suspect in cramped circumstances. According to Gargate, he was in bed in the kitchen. Sam Atkinson was a slightly built 26-year-old, although he looked older. He had previously been a seaman but now worked as a casual porter on the North Eastern Railway. He had been working at Lintz Green Station on the previous Saturday, October 7th, the day of the murder. Gargate took Atkinson into the next room and asked him to account for his movements. Atkinson said he had worked at the station as usual until about 4pm. I then went home. I remained in the house till about 7pm when I had a walk into the big market. Newcastle's big market, then as now, was a bustling gathering place filled with pubs. I only saw one man who I know by sight. I do not know his name or where he lives, but he is a casual porter on the North Eastern Railway, the same as myself. Gargate thought Atkinson's replies were unsatisfactory, and the accounts given by Atkinson's family regarding his whereabouts were contradictory. He decided to take Atkinson to Newcastle Central Police Station and detain him on suspicion of the murder of George Wilson. On the following morning, Gargate transferred Atkinson in a motorcar to Consett Police Station. News of the arrest had spread quickly, and several thousand people were waiting at the station as the car arrived. Atkinson was bundled inside before any form of mob justice could be exacted. Later, 
Superintendent Joseph Dryden, who was effectively in charge of the investigation, made a statement. Dryden said Atkinson had been employed at Lintz Green Station for several months. On the day of the murder, he had finished his shift at 3.45pm and left the station for his home in Newcastle. However, Dryden said two witnesses had identified Atkinson as a man they saw loitering on the platform at a later hour at just about the time the last train arrived. Dryden's statement raised several questions. Who were the residents who identified Atkinson, considering the previously identified witnesses had not recalled seeing anyone? If Atkinson had returned to the station, would he not have been recognised by his colleagues Fred White, Thomas Routledge and George Wilson? Was there any evidence to link Atkinson to the crime, other than an inability to confirm his presence at Newcastle's hectic big market? Nevertheless, that evening Sam Atkinson was placed in front of a magistrate's court and charged with killing and slaying George Wilson. Atkinson was stunned. He was asked if he had any objection to being remanded in custody. I do not think it should be so. I've done no harm. I cannot see why I should be remanded. I can bring plenty of witnesses to show where I was on Saturday night. But Superintendent Dryden argued that Atkinson had been given every opportunity to confirm his whereabouts and had not been able to do so. Atkinson was held in remand. Meanwhile, police continued to search for the murder weapon in the woods around the station and in the River Derwent. On Saturday, October 14th, a week after the murder, it was revealed that they were hunting a second suspect. This was thought to be a mendicant, a wandering beggar, who had been sleeping rough in the area for the past week. Neither the weapon nor the suspect was found. Sam Atkinson appeared in court several times over the next few weeks. The court gave strict instructions that he was not to be photographed or sketched, as it would be unfair to him at the present stage of the proceedings. His solicitor, Edward Clark, said there was not a tittle of evidence. Clark objected to the use of the statements given by his client because they had not been given voluntarily and Atkinson had not been cautioned. At one point, a magistrate asked Atkinson if he had anything to say on the matter of being further remanded. Atkinson said, Well, I don't know why I should when I'm not guilty. The magistrate replied, I don't know about that. Atkinson was held in custody for four weeks until November 9th, when, with the police unable to offer any evidence, he was formally discharged. But Atkinson's life had been derailed. He was the most high-profile murder suspect in the country. His name was in every newspaper. He was a young lad who lived with his elderly mother. Before his arrest, he had saved the considerable sum of £19, and he intended to use that to buy a horse and cart and sell vegetables around Newcastle to support himself and his mother. But he had spent all his savings to secure his release, so unfortunately he never got his horse and cart. During the second week of November, five weeks after the murder, Durham police began to circulate notices offering a reward of £100 for information leading to the arrest of a young man aged between 20 and 22 who had maliciously shot the station master at Lintz Green. The suspect was around 5 feet 5 inches tall and clean-shaven, with a dark, sallow complexion. He was of medium build with square shoulders and walked with a slight stoop. It soon emerged that this description had been obtained from a gunsmith's shop in Newcastle, where the suspect had purchased a box of revolver cartridges on the day of the murder. The cartridges matched the type found at the scene. One young man was taken into custody at Bladen Police Station, but when a witness failed to pick the man out of a lineup, he was released. By the end of 1911, Wilson's murder remained unsolved, but in January 1912, police received a tip that a man fitting the description of their suspect was working at Blackster Quarry in Northumberland. An officer was dispatched to interview him, but by the time he arrived, the man had fled. The new suspect was known as John Hall. He boasted of being good-looking with a good set of teeth. He had a tattoo of a woman on his right forearm, and he had the habit of, quote, frizzing his hair in the front. He kept himself aloof from his fellow workers, and they noticed that he seemed unsettled and nervous. The police made urgent inquiries and began to follow John Hall's trail. Then, on February 27th, an officer spotted the suspect and pursued him along Hadrian's Wall, the ancient Roman frontier defence. Hall was captured and arrested and admitted that he knew he was a wanted man. 
but it was quickly established that he had no connection to the Lintz Green murder. He was wanted on trivial charges by Yorkshire police. Hall was discharged and handed over to Yorkshire. Once again, the police had spent several weeks chasing the wrong man. Further leads were scarce. In the first week of March, Gateshead police received two anonymous letters. The letters described a man the sender had met on the road from Lintz Green toward Gateshead on the night of the murder. The police issued a notice asking the sender to contact them in confidence, but there were no further developments. Toward the end of 1912, in late November, a man was arrested in Shiremore, North Tyneside. He had pledged some goods with a pawnbroker that could apparently be linked to the murder. But nothing came from the arrest. There were reports of a further arrest in February 1914, but again there were no charges. The next apparent breakthrough came in 1915, during the early months of the Great War. The latest suspect was Philip May, a soldier with the Northumberland Fusiliers Regiment of the British Army. Superintendent Dryden said May had made a statement to his superior officer in which he confessed to killing George Wilson. He was arrested and charged, but May denied any knowledge of the murder. He was remanded to Durham Jail to allow police to investigate. A week later, he was discharged for lack of evidence. He was handed over to the military police regarding a separate offence. May, it seemed, was a troublemaker, but not a murderer. The Lintz Green Station murder became a cold case, but it was not entirely forgotten. In September 1927, 16 years after the murder, another anonymous letter was received, this time by Scotland Yard in London. The sender claimed that a man who lived at a given address in Glasgow could throw fresh light on the crime. Scotland Yard passed the matter to Glasgow Police, which sent detectives to interview the man. But Glasgow informed Scotland Yard that the man knew nothing whatsoever about the murder and had never been to the north of England. As the Scottish Sunday Post commented, the Lintz Green murder must therefore remain an unsolved mystery, and it remains unsolved and mostly forgotten. There was a brief resurgence of newspaper interest in 1933, following the death of former superintendent Joseph Dryden, but his death effectively ended police and media interest in the Lintz Green murder. Ultimately, Dryden and his men had failed to solve the crime. Their investigation was flawed. They had jumped to hasty conclusions and pursued weak theories and wrong suspects with little or no evidence, but they had very little evidence to go on. During the pre-war era, the public might have expected crimes to be solved in a relatively straightforward manner, with Sherlock Holmes-style powers of deduction. But true crimes did not always fit into popular narratives. The police had no direct witness, no murder weapon and no clear motive. The murderer had slipped away on that dark night into the woods and into anonymity. The murder did subsequently make a connection with Sherlock Holmes. The Practical Handbook of Bee Culture is a fictional work supposedly written by Holmes about his beekeeping and final investigations. In the book, Holmes declines the request of the local police to investigate the murder of George Wilson. My health will not allow me to go to Durham at the moment, he writes, and anyway the trail is cold. Even fiction's greatest detective could not solve the Lintz Green murder. So now I'm coming up to the station. I can see two overgrown stone platforms. And this is the scene of the murder. The station master's house is still standing behind the north platform. But it's still inhabited. It still feels isolated too. The arched stone bridge survives. As do the stone steps and wrought iron railings and stiles. You can still walk from the south platform up the steps and through the stile onto the bridge and across and down onto the north platform just like George Wilson did on the night of his murder. And the house's current owners are still maintaining the garden where he took his last breath. Today, the overgrown remains of Lintz Green Station stand as a reminder of the North Eastern Railway and its era of steam and coal. A reminder of George Wilson too, even if his story is not well known. Some locals know the station master's house as the murder house, but few who hike or cycle past know its full history. For most visitors, it's a charming English countryside location. 
perhaps until night falls and isolation closes in, evoking thoughts of dark events on a black night back in 1911. In the next episode of Singular Discoveries, another true story from the forgotten corners of history. To receive new episodes for free, just follow Singular Discoveries on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to binge listen the entire season ad-free right now, just go to singulardiscoveries.com. The Lintz Green Murder was written and produced by Paul Brown based on his e-book, The Lintz Green Station Murder. You can find more of his writing at stuffbypaulbrown.com. Singulardiscoveries.com. 